Hurricane Milton making its way into Florida this evening, now down to Category 3. Let's take a closer look at it. The Tampa Ruskin radar, very good for viewing this storm. And this gives us some high resolution imagery very close to the eye wall. So we can monitor most of what's going on right there. The eye wall located here, a little less visible on the other side. We can track this using the northern portion of the eye wall where we have the gradient of reflectivity. That suggests a very gradual movement towards about 050 azimuth, which would probably bring the eye towards Sarasota and Bradenton. There has been some concern that maybe it might move towards Tampa Bay. That's not totally off the table. However, we'll watch this over the next hour or two, and I'll check back in later on this program to see where we're at. We do have very active spiral bands off to the east, some of those have produced tornadoes in the eastern part of the state. These purple boxes, those are all tornado warnings. Fortunately, this cluster of storms appears to be moving offshore, but we're not totally out of the woods as we have other spiral bands in the southwestern part of the state. Tornadoes have been reported today all the way from Fort Myers over to just north of West Palm Beach and up the coast towards Melbourne. This is probably not the full accounting of tornadoes, but so far we have 19 confirmed around the state. And you can see how active things have been across the Florida Peninsula this afternoon. Numerous deep convective cells in the southern and southeastern part of the peninsula. The highly sheared environment there favorable for supercell formation. The Weather Service in Miami has issued more tornado warnings today than on any previous calendar day. On the infrared satellite imagery for last night, about 12 to 18 hours ago, we had a well-defined annular hurricane. This central dense overcast, the well-defined eye, that gave a Dvorak scale T rating of 7.5, which is pretty high up there. You can only go up to 8 on that scale, and there's an informal 8.5. So this is getting into the top of the scale. However, this morning, a change in the structure as the hurricane encountered a sheared environment. There's how it looked from the Florida perspective. This is around dawn, and we go into the morning hours, and uh, we fill that eye with that central dense overcast, and gradually the T numbers start shifting downwards, indicating weakening of the storm. And we're just kind of left with this patchwork of cold tops and this large central dense overcast. But as we come within range of the high-quality wsr 88 d radars, we're in a better position to assess the structure of the storm. And of course, we've got a very high quality surface observation network in the US, ASOS and other sites. And as we zoom in, we can kind of go through all of these and we see the winds up to about 43 knots out around the Fort Myers area. We go closer to Sarasota and Tampa. We've got gusts up to 45 and even 52 there around Clearwater. And we've got 55 knots at St. Petersburg. That's going to be about 62 miles an hour. And we can also use mesonet data. Now, this comes from a variety of sources, federal, state, private, including individuals such as the uh, CWAP network and Weatherbug and that kind of thing. Now, we've got gusts in red. And you always have to ask yourself, is that knots or is that miles an hour? So we click on uh, this station right here, 46. That's going to be 46 miles an hour or 40 knots. Got to keep in mind that when we're looking at these plots, these are going to be in knots. See like 33 right here, that is 33 knots. So you always have to be aware of that when you're working with wind data. Let's take a quick look at the weather elsewhere around the country. This is the surface analysis showing high pressure moving into the northeastern U.S. and into the Midwest. Temperatures in the 60s and 70s with a clearing trend. We've got cold air advection showers in the northeastern U.S. Temperatures quite cool in the 50s and 60s there. But you can see some of the drier air, the dew points running in the 30s and 40s. 
the center of the cold air over western Quebec, the 534 decameter contour, 4,000 through 500 millibar thickness, center just west of Ottawa. So that will have to continue moving out, being advected southeastward, so probably another day or two of cool weather in the northeastern U.S. Of course, Milton moving northeast, but it is in training dry air from the northern Gulf. Dew points down into the 50s all the way to New Orleans and Pensacola. Looking a little bit more like summer as you go west, we've got the thermal low. Temperatures 105 at Phoenix, 94 at Las Vegas. And equally warm in Texas, maybe not 100s, but certainly lots of 90s around Lubbock and Amarillo. A lee side trough extending from Miles City down towards Springfield, Colorado, but a new burst of cold air. This is maritime polar air moving into the northwestern U.S. So in the wake of that, also cold air advection showers from Bellingham up to, uh, what's that, Prince George? And we've got this frontal system on the prairies, a triple point into western Saskatchewan. Then as we go north, not really a whole lot of weather going on, but we are looking for a major storm out there in the Bering Sea. And there it is, emerging from the Bering Sea. There's the Alaska Peninsula and the Aleutians, and we see rapid deepening around late Friday and Saturday. Down to 958 millibars around Kodiak, maybe just to the southwest of there, and a atmospheric river focusing on the southern Alaska coast, and that'll shift eastward into the Juneau, Ketchikan area. They could see some intense flooding in that part of the state. And here's what we're talking about. This slug of Pacific energy wrapping northward into Alaska towards the weekend, and especially into southeastern Alaska. IVT values up near 1,000, which is pretty significant. And that will work its way down the coast into Monday and affect parts of British Columbia, Vancouver Island, Vancouver, and Seattle. Then it'll gradually fizzle out. But you can see this little tail end boundary right there. So continuation of stormy weather. There comes another weather system heading for the western U.S. And not much going on up north. Things cooling down very slowly in the Canadian High Arctic. Starting to see a little bit of widespread snow up there around Devon Island up to Elif Rignus Island. All right, back to the U.S. Let's, let's check out the upper air real quick. Of course, everybody wants to get back and look at Milton, which we will do shortly. But I want to get this out of the way so we have the most updated data by the time we upload this video. So in the upper levels, we've got progressive flow, almost zonal. We've got the jet coming in from the central North Pacific into the Canadian prairies, rounding this ridge structure into this trough structure off of the East Coast area. And this trough helping to pick up Milton. So we're gonna see that rapidly lift to the Northeast. If this was ridging, we would have probably a higher chance of Milton working inland, but that is not expected. Quick look at the upper air pattern over the next few days. You see this ridge shifting to the East, but the long wave ridge actually retrogresses. So we see intensification of this ridge, this ridge right here, and gradually we build this structure right here over Western Canada. So by the time we get into Sunday and Monday, a highly amplified pattern, a deep trough associated with that strong system in the Gulf of Alaska, sharp ridging into Canada that will bring down some cold polar air into the Great Lakes area, the Midwest, Maybe not for the southwestern U.S. I'll just give you a sneak peek right here. This is the corresponding surface chart. Yeah, definitely cold air coming down across Ontario, but that's all going into the northeastern U.S. They always get the cold air, seems like, uh, you know, while we are dying down here in Texas. There's the surface anticyclone associated with that. That's the Bear Clinic Polar High which will gradually migrate down into the southeastern U.S. On the other side, the cold advection a little bit weaker and more prone to get into a southerly flow pretty quickly. So, yeah, very cold in the northeastern U.S. I guess we should just go ahead and go through these charts. Let me go back to the beginning. We'll just run through this very, very, very quickly. 
Okay, so there goes Milton later this evening. Cold front coming into the northwestern U.S. And most of that cold air just affects the northern tier states. Milton heads out to sea. Florida gets under northerly flow, some lingering showers through Friday. This cold air mass does not work very far south, mostly just affects the Great Lakes and the Corn Belt. And this next system, where did that come from? That was pretty quick. Yeah, that was this thing right here coming down on Saturday. That's got a little bit more of a punch. So that comes all the way into the southern U.S., but not so much into Texas. Then we get another frontal system. Again, this is of Pacific origin, affecting mostly the northern U.S. So by Friday, Saturday of next week, yeah, some cold air setting up up north, but I'm not totally sure that that's going to come down. It, it may very well do so with that 1032 millibar high, but we'll just check this out on uh, next week. Looking at the latest radar as Milton comes ashore as we approach the 7 p.m. Eastern hour. This dot back here, that's where I'd marked the southern periphery of that eye wall on the north side. And that appears to be in this area right here, which gives us a movement, something like this, that puts the main eye wall itself right through here, the eye in this area, and then the southern eye wall down here. So it appears it is heading mostly south of the Bay Area. The stronger storm surge probably will be a little bit further to the south, pretty much right in line with their forecast. So about 45 minutes ago, one of the planes got this fix that puts it just to the west, southwest of Sarasota. And there's also this other flight. Don't exactly know what happened. They were recording data and they were pretty close to the eye, but haven't received anything out of there in the past 15 minutes or so. But he is out there and safe, so I guess maybe they aborted that pass. Not sure exactly what happened. So anyway, I'm not really too sure what else I can add. I'm kind of burning time here, and I need to get this rendered and uploaded because this thing is about to make landfall. Let me give you the storm surge maps real quick. You probably noticed we have not been looking at the dynamical hurricane models because they are not really that useful at this point because now we're relying more on remote sensing data, actual observed information. That's all very important at this stage, and especially the radar data. So as you get closer and closer, you're basically developing a now cast instead of a forecast. So anyway, this is the storm surge, Tampa Bay down to Boca Grande, looking at 9 to 13 feet. These levels have come down from what they had last night. So I guess they're looking at a little bit less catastrophic picture, but... Again, it's very important that if you're near the coast and in an evacuation zone, you need to take this thing seriously because it was a Category 5 earlier today. And the storm surge threats take a long time to die off. And, of course, we also got the tides as well. Those reached a minimum about 11 a.m. this morning. They peak at 1 a.m., so that's going to add to the flood problems. And before I forget, a geomagnetic storm coming up for Thursday and Friday. See here, G4. There may be some minor impacts on the power grid, but I wouldn't really be too worried because we've had stronger storms in the past. Could be some pretty good auroras. See right here, northern half of the country, maybe even the northern two-thirds of the country may see an aurora display. So, yeah, definitely check that out. Get away from the city lights. And I would take a look, even if you were in the southern U.S., down there on the Gulf Coast, you may very well see some lights out there in the northern sky. A very last-minute look at the data across the Tampa Bay area. Still looking at only 62 miles an hour at St. Petersburg. Most of the other gusts under 50 at this time. The eye wall still not quite on shore just yet. This just came in minutes ago, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Yeah, we do have a fix there, 954 millibars. That's going to be just southwest of Sarasota. So I'm going to look at the wind data to find out where the maximum winds are. 
And what I found from that hurricane measurement, the stronger winds were in that band right here. So that is pretty close to the maximum wind eye wall. So that is not yet ashore. This is not the eye wall. That's a spiral band. So this is what we're waiting on. That's about to come on shore. That's got the core of maximum winds. And we're at this juncture at this moment. So I need to get this uploaded so you can check this out. So 6.13 p.m. Central, 7.13 p.m. Eastern. Hopefully we get this online quick. So yeah, it does look like a big problem from Sarasota, Bradenton, South, down the coast in this area. The bay may be looking a little bit better, but of course a major storm surge there. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get this posted. Hope you have a great evening. Take care. We'll be back on Friday for another edition. That will be for the supporters, though. So for the public, we'll be back on next Wednesday, unless something changes. Hope you have a great one. Stay safe. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.